Albert Einstein, Stephen Hawking, and Dr. Brian Greene, Columbia University professor and one of the brightest minds when it comes to theoretical physics. You are a rock star in the world of science, as far as I'm concerned, and I feel honored to talk to you, Dr. Green. I wore this shirt in your honor. It says, Jack me back into time, because from what I understand, we have 11 dimensions in our universe, and one of them being time. There's depth, and there's height, and there's width. And then there's seven other ones that um, I'm not exactly sure how to explain them, because everyone asks, what are the other dimensions? And I say, well, some of them are small, and some of them are big. Maybe we can perceive them, probably we can't, maybe someday we will. But how would someone like you answer that question to a layperson? Well, first thing I would stress, we don't know these other dimensions exist. So you need to know this is hypothetical, speculative ideas that come from rational mathematical theorizing of how the world works. But there are equations that suggest that the three dimensions of space that you were referring to, length, width, height, this way, that way, or that way, yeah. may not be the only dimensions of space. Mm -hmm. And as you suggested, the question of where the others are is a deep one, and one answer might be that they are all around us, tightly curled up, very small, that we can't directly access with our eyes or even with powerful equipment that we have today. Mm -hmm. So they could be right within our grasp, just currently too small for us to have direct access to. Well, let me try this. Have you ever see the movie Animal House? I remember the scene that you're about to refer to. It has to do with a fingernail. That's exactly and right. And a whole universe existing within it. That's and, right. And um, yes, it's a great scene. So that means that our whole solar system could be like one tiny atom in the fingernail of some other giant being. <laughs> oh, this is too much. That means. One tiny atom in my fingernail could be, could be one little tiny universe. <laughs> now, isn't that what M theory is, basically? In some sense, it expands on that prescient <laughs> idea from that film yeah. that came from late night drunken musings uh -huh. of the frat boys. Uh -huh. But yes, it is possible that there are worlds within worlds in the sense of there can be a lot more to the universe than we would expect based upon our everyday experience. And within the tiny nooks and crannies of space may be additional domains that have a profound impact in everything that we observe. Okay, so you're obviously not a drunken frat person. You not are at the moment. Not at the moment. How do you come up with these theories about the multiple universes or the idea of a uber space where there might be the world like Swiss cheese and our universe is just one of the holes within a chunk of Swiss cheese and then there's other universes in the other hole in the Swiss cheese? Where do you come up with this? Well, we're a hunger group of people, so cheese is always on our minds. But um, <laughs> yeah. no, it, it comes from looking at the world, coming up with mathematical ideas that can describe things that we do see, mm -hmm. that gives us confidence that the math is going in the right direction. And then we as a community, these ideas are not by any means attributed to me directly, but as a community, we then follow the mathematics to its logical conclusion. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes we have found that the math leads us to these strange ideas of other universes of a whole variety of realms expanding within a larger environment. That's the Swiss cheese. The holes would yeah. be different universes. Mm -hmm. The cheese would be space itself that continues to expand. Mm -hmm. And it suggests a reality that's much bigger, richer, deeper, more complex than the reality that you would anticipate based on direct observation. Math lets you see further. That doesn't mean, however, that the math is correct. It mm -hmm. could be that all these ideas are nonsense, then one day we'll look back at these crazy ideas that people were playing with in the early part of the 21st century, how misguided mm -hmm. they were. We may look back upon this era of time as constituting. On the other hand, these could be the breakthroughs that lead to the next level of understanding. That's what science is. You search in the dark and you don't know if you're right or wrong until there's observational proof or experimental verification. We've yet to reach that hurdle, that milestone yet. Where do you see you as a, one individual in terms of your place in the universe? Does, does it make you a nihilist, or, or do you see yourself connected to everything else, kind of like the force? Well, um, it's much more toward the latter than the former. I think it's amazing 
that we puny little creatures crawling around on our stomachs on this rock that goes around this nondescript star have been able to, through observation, through experiment, through mathematical theorizing, been able to learn so much about reality that we do know to be correct, mm -hmm. right? We can make predictions about the cosmic microwave background radiation, heat left over from the Big Bang. We can make predictions based on calculations about events that happened 13.7 billion years ago, and observation bears out the predictions. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. That is an amazing achievement. And to me, it gives me a sense of connection mm -hmm. to the cosmos. As you were saying, it makes me feel as though we are not isolated, we're not separate, we're able to understand what's out there and that brings us into some deep union with what is out there. Does that make you think that maybe there are other sentient beings in space? I, I, I would think, given the sheer numbers and all the Swiss cheeses and so on. Well, the connection to the ideas that we're talking about, universes, Big Bang, other universes, I don't directly link that up to any proof or any substantive reason for anticipating that there's other life out there. But separate from all that, yes. If you do look at the recent realization that most stars seem to have planets, we didn't know that 10, 15 years ago. Yeah. Now we know, of course, that there are hundreds of billions of stars in our galaxy, hundreds of billions of galaxies out there. Mm -hmm. If each of those has a planet, the numbers do seem to suggest the possibility of life being out there. The big question mark is intelligent life, right? Our planet had life for a very long time, but that life wasn't capable of building radio telescopes or spaceships. Mm -hmm. And without some asteroid that slammed in and wiped out the dinosaurs, it could still be that our planet could be teeming with life, but life that was not looking outward and able to make some connection. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, I don't think anybody does, what it takes to create intelligent life Maybe there are very rare few instances of that. If you consider us intelligent, not everybody agrees with that. Yeah. But if you do take that as a given, maybe we're special, maybe we're not, and we just have no way of knowing. Well, one thing we are is curious. Yes. And uh, you seem to be very curious. Where did that come from? Well, I think like many kids, I was struck by the questions of existence when I was little, right? Mm -hmm. Why am I here? What's it all about? And it quickly became clear to me that nobody knew the answer. Mm -hmm. So rather than trying to find answers, it struck me that maybe understanding the questions was the best substitute. And mm -hmm. physics is a field where you're asking these deep questions all the time. And that's what propelled me to immerse myself in these ideas. Well, I think that uh, there needs to be, and in my humble opinion, you know, more curiosity out there. And I think that that the biggest challenge to science and science funding, especially in our country, is trying to get more people to care. Yeah. And, and that's why I appreciate the science festival that's going on right now with the good folks at the Science Center, the Pacific Science Center that are bringing you here to uh, talk about Icarus at the Edge of Time, which I think is a neat story. How can we get people more curious about science and get them to care? Well, I would say it a little bit differently. I think that we all begin life as little scientists. We all are curious when we're little, and then the school system typically beats it out of us. Yeah. Again, I, 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 I'm reluctant to say that because there are many really good teachers in really good classrooms, but mm -hmm. by and large, on average, the kids that I talk to get turned off from science, and I know they begin curious. Every kid is. Yeah. So it's really a matter of the education system being, I think, a little bit less focused on assessment and testing, mm -hmm. and a little bit more focused on the parallel track of making the big, wondrous ideas of science apparent to kids at a very young age, inspiring them to want to learn the details that we so often want to test. And without the motivation of big questions. How did the universe begin? How did life begin? Where did consciousness come from? What will the universe be like 100 billion years from now? What's at the deep center of the black hole? Are there other universes? These kind of questions will get kids fired up and then the details will be something that they're more inspired to want to learn about. Well, the universe is an elegant place and it, as your book, The Elegant Universe, describes. And Dr. Brian Green, you are an elegant person the way that you can describe what is going on around us and how we got here. Thank you so much for taking the time to come, and uh, thank you for being part of the Pacific Science Center's Science Festival. I'd put you right up there with Stephen Hawking and well, Albert you. Einstein. Appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you.